Hello and welcome to this webinar, how to create content Google loves. Get in front of prospects when they're looking for you. There's the full subtitle there. I have to figure out how to arrange this so my head doesn't block my own content. But hopefully you know why you are here, how to create content Google loves. Um, and we are going to start with talking about um, why that's so important. If it will let me. Am I going to have to do this? There we go. Why? Why do we care? Why do we care about Google? First of all, I do want to talk about SEO, um, just kind of in general. I Obviously, I use that acronym a lot. Um, what it stands for is search engine optimization. So please don't say SEO optimize. That is one of my pet peeves. That's like saying pin number or ATM machine, and it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. So it is SEO or search engine optimized. Um, Search engine obviously is not strictly Google. There are other search engines, um, but Google has the vast majority of the online search market. So when we talk about SEO, we're talking about Google. So that's uh, just a little breakdown of our, our terminology here. So why do we care about Google? 95% of buyers use search engines like Google to look for small businesses. They're not always looking for the big guys. They're not always looking specifically for a product. Um, or a specific product or a specific brand, sometimes they are. Uh, more and more people like to shop local and they like supporting small businesses. So if you are not set up to uh, attract and engage those clients, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. Um, my next favorite, SEO gives you a chance to get in front of people when they're looking for you. It's so much easier than cold calling or meeting new people at networking, which is great for me. I do love that. But there are a lot of people there who are going, huh? What, what do you do? Why should I care? What's going on? Um, by contrast, when people are searching for your services or your product, they're already interested. They are already expressing interest in what you're doing. So getting in front of them when they're doing that is so powerful and makes it easier to, again, convert them once they're ready to buy. Uh, gives you a chance to position yourself as an authority in your industry, build trust with your audience. People do trust Google, that's why we use it so much. People do trust people, uh, websites that rank organically. There's some, you know, ads work, but there are a bunch of people, myself included, who will skip right past the ads and go to the first organically ranked uh, position link in there because that's what we trust more than someone who paid to show up at the top of Google. So yes, people believe you just because you you managed to convince Google that you're trustworthy. Um, Leads that are looking for you when they conduct a search tend to be high quality leads. So that's why we care. I think you all know me, um, but for those of you watching the recording, if you're not familiar with me or if you are wondering who the heck is this Allison character and why should we care what she has to say, I majored in English and psychology, turned out to be the perfect degree for what I'm doing, had no clue this was an option, thought I wanted to work in publishing, Graduated in 2009, right after the job market crashed. So that wasn't going to happen. So I ended up answering phones for a few years. It was a job. It was not a career. Uh, found myself between jobs at one point. My roommate at the time, her dad, who was an attorney, was awesome and offered to give me stuff to do around his office until I got back on my feet. And one of the things he needed was someone to write blog posts for his law firm. And he knew I had a strong writing uh, background. So he offered me the gig. And I was like, what? I can get paid to write? Seriously? Yeah, sign me up. So I jumped at that chance and started writing for him and then for an associate of his and then for some friends of mine. Um, and I, I will say, I do always like uh, putting this little plug in there, the fact that after six months, I would write two to four blog posts per month for him. And after six months, he came back and told me that I had brought in $75,000 worth of business to his law firm in the past six months just by the blog posts I was writing for him. So that was my first clue that like, this is not just busy work. <laughs> This is not just him doing a favor for me. This is actually having an impact on his business. Um, so I have tried to emulate that and, and continue that trend as I have continued my writing career. This was back in 2012, 2013, when ranking on Google was as easy as creating content once in a while. It has gotten much more competitive. Um, many, many more businesses, big and large, have gone, oh, Google likes content. Google likes this kind of content. This is what we should probably be doing if we want to show up on Google, if we want to actually engage and convert those leads who are coming to our website. So there's many, many more blogs. I think there's something like 4 million new blog posts published every day. On average, that's a lot, right? So that's when I started um, 
integrating SEO best practices, learning more about SEO keywords, all that good stuff, as well as marketing strategies. So I could really make the content as effective as possible. And hence, this webinar was born. All right, so it starts with keywords. I'm not going to talk too much about keywords because I gave a whole presentation last month on keywords. Yolanda, I know, was there taking a whole bunch of notes. Those of you who are not there, it is up on my YouTube channel at Allison Verhalen Content Marketer. You can go find it. It's free for everyone to watch. Um, I will just say that it that is still the cornerstone of, of search as far as Google is concerned. What are people searching? What content has these words and phrases that people are using when they are looking for stuff? Um, Google has gotten smarter about keywords, which means a keyword stuffing no longer works. Keyword stuffing is when you stuff as many keywords into your keyword as you can possibly keyword. And it's, it worked in the early days of SEO, um, does not work anymore and can actually backfire on your SEO effort. So yes, you need your target keyword in there a, a good number of times to get Google's attention, but not too much. You can also use synonyms. So uh, for example, I write for attorneys a lot, right? I can use attorney and lawyer interchangeably because Google has gotten really good at understanding that those two words mean the same thing. Um, so that's a great word to uh, a great way to continue to get more keywords in there, rank uh, for, for, for target keywords uh, in search terms because you are using words that mean the same thing. Google's gonna go, oh, they're using this word and this word, they're not keyword stuffing. They're really talking about this content, okay, or this topic. Okay, so yes, you need to know your keywords. Um, there's a whole, like I said, whole presentation on how to research keywords. So I'm not gonna talk about that here. I will talk about where to put your keywords because it's super important. Just like when you find a new website, right? Uh, you're gonna start with the title. You're probably not gonna look at the URL, but Google will. You're gonna look at the title. You might look at the meta description before clicking through to the website. Uh, you're probably gonna scan the subheadings throughout the content. Um, and then you're actually gonna, if, if all that has caught your attention and said, yeah, okay, this is really for me, then you're gonna start reading more in depth into the content. Google's the same way. Google looks at things like your title, your URL, your meta description, and your subheadings before it looks throughout your content. Your meta description, when um, you can put that in on the back end of your website so that when your uh, website shows up in Google, it's got your heading, uh, the title of the page there, and then there's a short few lines of description talking about what it's about. That shows up right underneath your headline. That's what people see before they click through to your website. So that's what the meta description is. I always make sure my keyword is in there because again, from a search perspective, if I'm searching something and something pops up and I don't see my keyword or I see part of the keyword, but not the full keyword in the meta description, I'm a lot less likely to click through. I'm gonna keep scrolling until I find something that looks like it's closer to what I'm actually looking for. So, and then yes, use it throughout your content. And again, use synonyms, use related keywords. There is one target keyword that's your main keyword you're targeting for each piece of content you create, but it should never be just one keyword that you're using. You should have a whole bunch of related keywords that you are also sprinkling throughout your content because that's going to be really effective. Um, how long should my blog post be? I get this question all the time. There is no one answer. Well, okay, the one answer is at least 500 words. If you're typing it up in a Word document, single space, that's about one page. So it's really not that much. Um, that is the minimum. Google does like longer content. It assumes longer content is more valuable than shorter content, which we can all, I was going to say, we can disagree with. We can't argue with it because Google has all the leverage in this relationship. So we have to play by its rules if we want to show up when people are looking for us. So at least 500 words, um, which again, is not that long. Um, people often ask me if it depends on uh, your industry, if people, everyone thinks that no one in their industry is reading long blog posts. Um, and that's not really true. A lot of the data shows that longer blog posts do get more engagement. People do spend more time engaging with those longer blog posts. So yes, write longer blog posts, but also make them skimmable. Again, that's where the subheadings come in throughout your content. Um, so have that content, make it super skimmable, make it really easy for people to skim. Um, so it does not depend on your industry. It does depend on your keyword because some keywords are gonna have a lot of content associated with it, um, a lot to cover on that topic. 
sometimes there is only five, 700 words to cover on a certain topic. And in, in that case, absolutely, write 700 words and call it a day. Don't fill it with fluff because you feel like you have to reach some arbitrary word count. Um, I will say, I think uh, the last I saw the average uh, length of a blog post to rank on the first page of Google was around 1500 words. But again, that's the average. So there's longer, there's also shorter. And again, I would say it depends on your keywords. So once you get to that 500 words, I would say just make sure you're covering everything there is to cover on that topic. That's how you get that ultimate guide style post, which Google loves. Um, but if, like I said, if it gets to 700 words and you think you've said all there is to say, then you're done. <laughs> Move on to the next thing. Jen, you have a question? Yes, this might be a silly question, but there's no silly question, right? No um, such thing. Okay, so when you say blog post, what constitutes a blog post? I don't have a separate blog, quote unquote. I post on social media. I post mostly on LinkedIn and Instagram, a little bit on Facebook. But is a blog post something different where you have on your website a blog? And yeah, so talk to me about that for a minute. <laughs> Yes, that last one. A uh, blog lives on your website. Yes, there are LinkedIn articles. Yes, you can have long posts on uh, Facebook. Usually not as long as the like 1500, 2000 words. Um, I don't think there's an official cutoff, but uh, people have said that when they try to write super long content on LinkedIn articles, it just gets cut off at a certain point. Um, so I, I always recommend having it live on your blog, um, on your website, because that is the only real estate that you own. So if you are, hey, that's going to help your SEO, right? If you're creating all this other content for LinkedIn and Facebook, that's going to help LinkedIn and Facebook's SEO, which is already awesome. They don't need any help. Um, it's not doing anything to help your SEO. So having a ton of content that lives on your website that people can see, uh, that Google can see and go, okay, this is what they're talking about. This is what this website is about. That's going to help, A, that that article, uh, that searchability, but also um, the, the general SEO of your whole website. So yes, have it live on your blog. Absolutely use social media to distribute that blog post. That's how I operate. I write a blog post and then it becomes a video on YouTube and then it becomes, you know, it gets sprayed out on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and all the things, but it lives on my blog, on my website so that I control everything that happens to it. Um, how frequently should you post is another question. Um, I would, again, Google loves consistency. Um, Google also loves frequency. So yeah, the best performing websites post multiple blog posts per day. That is not realistic for most of us. I'm not telling you to post every day. You're going to drive. Even I don't do that, right? I post once a week. Um, I would say ideally twice a week. The, the last bit of data I saw was that people were investing in fewer pieces of content, but longer pieces of content. So they were really diving into those long in-depth pieces of content and only posting like every other week. Um, so I think that's really good if, if you can manage it. Um, if you can only do once a month, do once a month, really don't go less than once a month because any less than that and Google's going to forget about you. Your audience is going to forget about you. So ideally once, once or twice per month, have a new blog post up. Um, the ideal, I do want to talk about something more than blog posts, um, sales pages, landing pages, home pages can be super short. Um, they already have a ton of SEO because you're linking a bunch of stuff there. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Your sales pages. I've seen around 800 words as a good recommendation for sales pages. I will say people are less likely to like really dive in to content on a sales page because if they've gotten that far, they're already most of the way towards buying from you. You, you don't have to do a whole lot of convincing. Yes, you have to tell them what to expect, what the benefits are, why they should work with you. Um, but if, especially for those of us in the B2B industry, like they've, there's been a long buyer journey. They've already consumed a lot of your content. They've probably had some conversations with you. They're getting ready to buy. So just, um, again, 500 words as a minimum, but I don't think you need to go too much longer than 500 words on your sales pages. Cause that gets kind of overwhelming.
Google loves lists. People love lists too. There's a reason you get a lot of clicks on things like, you know, 10 tips to make your content Google friendly, seven reasons you should care about this, five ways to blah, -de blah, -de blah. There's a reason you see those everywhere. It's because they work. And Google loves them. If you've ever seen that featured snippet, um, that's what shows up usually at the top of a Google search if you're looking for a bit of information. And Google goes, well, this page over here has a ton of information on this. They're going to show you that list. That's your, your subheadings um, that are on that blog post. It's going to, Google is going to pull those subheadings and put it into a featured snippet. So it's usually at the top of the page. Um, and instead of like a little meta description, it's like a whole block of, of text that so you get a, a really good idea of what's in there before you click through. Um, massive click-through rate. <laughs> Those That featured snippet is SEO gold because um, most people are going to click on that because it's so uh, prominently, not only prominently placed, but again, because it's bigger and it's showing more information as to what's on the page, they're going to be more likely to click through. List is a great, great way to get that featured snippet. Um, I'm not saying that every blog post has to be a list, uh, but if you can make it into a list, absolutely do that because it also makes it easier for again real life people to consume. They're going to scan that list. They're going to look for the information that is most pertinent to them before clicking through. And I want to talk about making content scannable because I, I know that we need the longer content because it gets more engagement. But on the other hand, I think uh, the average person only spends a few seconds on each page before clicking away, which is super frustrating. Um, so yes, you do have to get their attention super fast. That's what the hook is for. And you also have to make it scannable. So I would say don't fight the fact that they're spending a few minutes or a few seconds on your page and then clicking away. Work with it. Make it work for you. Make it really easy for them to go, here's this information and this information and this information. I put that on my blog by having a table of contents at the top. Um, it just lists out each subheading in throughout the blog post um, and each one in the table of contents becomes a link. So they can click on it and jump straight to that section in the blog post. So if they're like, yeah, I know about this. I know about this. I know, oh, I don't know about this. I wanna know more over here. They can go straight to it, make it super easy. If they see a giant block of text, they're gonna get intimidated and click away. Even I'll get intimidated and click away. I'm I'm a reader, but I also have limited amounts of time. So if I see all that text, I'm going to be like, I don't know if I have time for this. I'll go find what I need somewhere else. Or I don't care enough <laughs> to dig through all of this, right? Make it really easy for them to find it. Make it original. Um, I doubt any of you are the only person doing what you do in the world. I know I'm certainly not the only person doing what I do in the world, but we all have our own unique perspectives, perspectives and our own unique way of, of bringing uh, information to the world and, and bringing our products and services to the world. So bring that perspective to your content because that's what's going to help you stand out. Don't just say, um, you know, here's what you need to know about this new update in the world recently, right? Because if it's a new shiny update, Chances are a lot of people in your industry are going to be talking about it. So what, what are only you saying about it? Um, Google prioritizes original content. Um, so if it sees that your content is like really similar <laughs> to something someone else said, does not have to be word for word. But if it's too similar to something someone else said, or even too similar to something you've said on your own website, I made that mistake where I, I was not paying attention to something I had written and accidentally wrote the same blog post and published it without realizing that I was creating duplicate content on my own website. So I had to take down one of them so that I was not fighting myself for that keyword, right? Or creating duplicate content. So absolutely make it original, keep it original, have your own perspective, have a story element involved because that A is going to be original and B is going to be more engaging. People are going to be more likely to keep reading. And, oh, oh, link building. I am also going to have a whole other uh, webinar on this. So I'm also not going to go too deep into link building. I do want to touch on it because it's super important. Um, so when you link, there are internal links and there are external links. An internal link is, for example, I just had a blog post about um, such and such, and I'm referring to this other blog post on a related topic. Here's the link to that blog post. So I'm linking from a page on my website to a page, another page on the same website. That is an internal link. 
if I provide a link to another website and say, hey, Andy Crestodina has this great data over here, or you know, the data shows such and such, I'm not pulling this out of my butt, you can go see the data over here on this website. That's an external link. Um, both count for SEO. Google loves the internal links. Google really loves the external links because that is someone else saying, hey, this person is really, they really know what they're talking about. They're an expert in their industry. You should go check out this information that they have over on their website. So getting those links is, A, giving those links is good too because there's a certain amount of tit for tat and Google sees that you're playing nice with others. And again, it provides value to your, your content. If you're saying, if you can link to information or other content that, that backs up what you're saying, it makes you that much more credible. So absolutely link to other people's websites when it makes sense to do so. Um, a lot of people worry about people clicking away and never coming back. The way to, to avoid that is to make sure that it opens, you can include it in the tab, um, in the hyperlink, make sure that it opens in a new tab when they click over there um, so that they at least have your website still open on a tab. Um, but those external links are great for SEO. Google assumes like hangs out with like. So hopefully you're getting links from really high quality websites that are, A, it's got to be relevant. Um, and B, it has to be high quality already ranking on Google for relevant keywords. Because if those kinds of people are linking to your website, Google is going to go, oh, well, this is a really great website. And they're referring to this other website. So it must be good. Uh, it works the other way too. <laughs> Just like in high school, right? If you're hanging out with the cool kids, you must be cool. If you're hanging out with the troublemakers, you must be a troublemaker. So if there's websites with spammy content and using black hat SEO tactics and Google does not like it and they're providing links to your website, that can actually hurt your SEO. Um, there are ways to disavow those links. There are ways to get more link, the high quality links. Um, and again, I will talk about that in an upcoming webinar. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, let's talk about, uh, over here, the elephant in the room, AI, chat, GPT, all the good stuff. Um, remember what I said a couple slides ago about making your content original? A lot, a lot of my problem with AI, um, especially if you're just putting in a prompt and having it generate something for you, is that it's not generating anything. It's scraping content that already exists from the internet and repurposing it for you and going, here you go, here's new content. It's not new, it's repurposed old stuff. Um, and Google will sit up and take notice. Google knows if you're saying the same thing everyone else is saying. And after a while, everyone else is also gonna catch on. So the way I do like to use it, oh, and Google has also been uh, giving some mixed messages <laughs> when it comes to how it views AI content. On the one hand, it started saying, no, AI content is terrible. We don't want to rank it. Um, don't use AI if you want content, if you want to rank. And then they have Google Bard come out and they're like, well, maybe AI content is not that bad. <laughs> Sometimes it can be okay. Um, so my recommendation is to always make sure it's original and it has your unique perspective. Um, couple ways you can go about doing this, have AI write what I call the boring parts, like just give me the information, just give me the five ways to and six reasons for such and such. Then you go in and add your unique perspective. You go in and add the so what, the, the answer to the question, so what, or why should I care? Because that's the what's in it for me, right? That's what everyone is there for. What's in it for me? Why should I care? Why am I here? Are you wasting my time? Or is there something of value here? So have your unique perspective. Write a story. AI is terrible at writing stories, so don't have AI do that and don't have AI write your call to action because it's terrible at that too. Um, make sure that you are doing those elements yourself. Um, the other way to use it where I have seen people using it is where they kind of word vomit their ideas for a blog post, but they need some help organizing it into a blog post. AI is great at taking existing information and organizing it for you. Um, so if you are providing the, the content that it's using as the base for a blog post or even a sales page, that's going to have your unique perspective in there. And you're just using AI to organize it for you. I think that's a great way to use it. Um, <clears throat> just make sure you are at least editing it. Make sure it's in your brand voice before you put it out into the world. Make sure it's accurate because even if you provide the information, um, Let's see, Jen says, per AI, I usually write thoughts and ask ChatGPT to improve it. Yeah, that's a great way to use AI. Just be like, I know this is kind of what I want to say, but it's not quite how I want to say it. So help me out here. ChatGPT is great for that. I absolutely recommend that. 
And then <laughs> some of it is cheesy. Yeah, it is. That's why you have to edit it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, these are some, uh, words from some of my clients. I consider Alison one of the best investments ever because I see her command of both English and SEO. Don't usually see those two together. And I will say that for myself as well, having networked and tried to network with a lot of other marketers, I talk to SEO professionals. I talk to writers. It is hard to find writers who are creative and also know about SEO and know how to know how to walk that fine line between creating content that a real live human is going to want to read, but will also uh, catch and catch Google's attention. Um, Elise Stein said working with me was a breeze, creating blog posts felt like a daunting chore, and I was able to take that off uh, her plate and run with it completely. I always research everything, provide fresh content that is new um, and uh, relevant to their brand and their field and their audience. Um, and I do try to be uh, a, a good person to collaborate with, uh, be kind, considerate, timely, and attentive. That is a big complaint that I hear is that writers never, uh, you know, they take their, their deposit and you never hear from them again. <laughs> that is not me. I will communicate. I will get stuff turned in on time. Lubin, uh, Peter Lubin has been, I think he's one of my oldest clients. My first client hired me for years and years and then retired. And Peter Lubin, um, uh, was my second client who I still write for. <laughs> and we were on the phone one time and he said, I don't know how you make such boring content sound so lively. I was like, oh, good. Because again, Peter's another attorney. So he he thinks his content is very boring. <laughs> but I look at it as, well, you're helping people with their livelihoods here. This is not This is not just peanuts. So I was able to put that into the content and make it so much more effective for him. So Love that little testimonial. Um, and that's it. So this is just the beginning. If you want to scan that QR code, you can uh, use that to schedule a meeting with me. Um, at all of you who registered are going to get that email anyway. You have all my contact information. And like I said, you'll get the recording, which I will stop here. So thank you, all of you who are watching the recording. Thank you, those of you who attended. And I will see you next time.